So let's talk about your book, Beyond the Pale, a fable about escaping the hustle and finding yourself. I read it on flights and at the airports on my recent business trip, and I couldn't put it down, and I was really looking forward to talking to you about it. I came up with this idea where we would follow the journey of third man. I wanted to make him such an extreme version of success so that we could relate to him in a weird way. I think we put rich people, powerful people, famous people, etc., on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. We assume that once you reach a certain level of whether it's wealth or wisdom or power or whatever, suddenly you figure it out. That suddenly it all makes sense. And I just don't believe that's true. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that being a billionaire means you have greater problems than someone who's on the poverty line, because that would be ridiculous. People at the top, they still have problems, internal struggles, existential worries. They're still human. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter who we are, the walk of life we've been on, who we meet, we all share that commonality of human. Mm -hmm. And it's this whole idea of, you know, going literally beyond your pale and finding that flow state. He just seemed very serendipitous. I was like, yes, that's the exact journey he's going to be going on. He's going to go beyond his pale. Welcome to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. How to make it, save it, keep it. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question. What it means to live a rich life beyond money. My guests share their practices, principles, and evergreen wisdom. I'm your host, Bogumil Baranowski, author, TEDx speaker, investor, and a founding partner of Seacard Associates, a boutique investment firm founded in New York City. Join me on this quest to unearth the wisdom of the ages. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad you're tuning into my podcast. For your convenience, the show is available on a multitude of platforms, including Spotify, Apple, Google, Audible, and many more. If you want to keep up with all new episodes, and there's so many more in the queue, make sure you subscribe and please do share it with friends and family. Review it and rate it if you can. Every little gesture matters, and I thank you for it. If you'd like to know more about me, or if you're interested in getting in touch, simply Google my name, and it will lead you straight to my website. There is a contact form there, or check notes to this episode for links. I love hearing how you listen to my podcast on your walks, hikes, alone times, drives, trips, and more. I trust that my guests and I are a wonderful company on those adventures. I also enjoy reading how some of you are rehearsing and answering some questions that I ask my guests. I love hearing that. If you're new to the show, please scroll down and check out all the amazing guests I've had over the last few months. If you are serious about investing, money wisdom, wealth, and living a better life, you'll find plenty of episodes with some incredible ideas. For those who enjoy reading thoughtful pieces, I regularly write articles on Substack, which I'm sure you'd find insightful. Find me there and follow me as well. Finally, I'd like to mention my latest book, Crisis Investing. It's a collection of 100 essays that I penned for our clients during the tumultuous times of the global COVID pandemic. These essays are both timely and timeless, providing a unique perspective on navigating through crises. They were never meant to be published, but here they are available to you. Please find the book on Amazon. The book has already received considerable recognition and much love, ranking among the top releases on Amazon in its initial weeks. Thank you for your support and for being a part of my listener community. Now, without further ado, let's dive into today's episode. My guest today is Matthew Turner. He's a British author who wrote his latest book, Beyond the Pale on the back of interviewing hundreds of successful entrepreneurs, authors, investors, and thought leaders. As well as writing his own books, Matthew Ghost writes both articles and books for other successful entrepreneurs and thought leaders in between spending time with his two children. Today, we talk about his book, Beyond the Pale, a fable about escaping the hustle and finding yourself. Matthew shares insights on the hero's journey in his book, exploring personal transformation, business success, and rediscovery of vision. 
We talk about the theme of praising achievement you know, in our culture. Matthew shares his thoughts on the concept of being a self-made person. We discuss some of the powerful questions asked in the book. We talk about the importance of rest and slowing down. We also talk about the theme of control and then realization of limitations in controlling every aspect of life. We talk about freedom and the paradox between wealth and feeling imprisoned. Matthew also shares a quote, the more you want something, the less likely you are to find, and we explore it further. We talk about scarcity and the difficulty of shaking it off. At the end, Matthew shares his own personal definition of success. As a bonus, Matthew offered to give away a copy of his book. If you like this episode and you would like a copy of the book, find out a way to get in touch with me and send me an email and we will select winners. Thank you so much and please help me welcome Matthew Turner. Well, hello, Matthew. Nice to see you. Welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Real pleasure. So you know that I really enjoyed your book, and we'll talk a lot about your writing and this book in particular. And I feel that you have a way of distilling some timely and timeless lessons from the world around you. And I know that you met a lot of people, interviewed a lot of people, collected a lot of lessons that you thought can serve you, but also, I think, a broader audience as well. So I want to talk about it today. But before we talk about your book, I want to talk about Matthew, about you. And if you indulge me, I like to ask my guests about their childhood and upbringing and how they think that time influenced the career path and the life they're living today. So tell me as much as you want to share. I am a born and bred Yorkshireman. So I've always lived, always been moved in the north of England in Yorkshire. And I had what I look back on just as very, you know, cool upbringing. Mm-hmm. Parents who stayed together, a, sin- a sister, older and I played a lot of sport and I just did a lot of things and I always had support of my parents. But I suppose when you reach a certain point in life and you start to pull a thread, you start to question where certain things came from. Now I realized that I had a great deal of support, but there was also a degree of um, emotional intelligence, which was left on the table for me. Mm -hmm. And I always found it very difficult to express myself. I always found it very difficult to articulate what I was feeling, my emotions, my thoughts. Always was swarming with questions in my mind and I didn't quite understand how to deal with them. So it developed into a lot of anxiety and I look back now and realize, you know, I didn't really know it and recognize it because how do you? So my upbringing was fantastic, but, you know, I had plenty of flaws and I had plenty of imperfections and I look back and wish certain things were a different way, but. It being the way it was has led me to explore writing. And it's how I got into writing in my early 20s. I found my way to express myself. And it remains the way I, I express myself. I love that. So I'm in the investment world. We manage money for wealthy individuals. And I read a lot. And I can't imagine being an investor without reading a lot. And I read all kinds of books. And I came across your book. And I found it really inspiring. That's why I reached out to you. But also... A lot of investors write, even if they don't publish, they write. And even if it's in the form of a journal, I think it helps us organize our thoughts. Once it's written, it has a different weight to it. And we can see more things and we can poke holes in the way we see the world. Yes. And then I, I think it takes some courage to publish. So I always admire authors. I, I published a few books myself and, and I write articles that people read. But it makes you more vulnerable because people have their opinions and views and they don't necessarily agree with you. And sometimes you have absolutely no control over how people read what you write because they see it through their own experience. So I'm curious what the experience was like for you to write and at some point choose to publish. What was that like? It was difficult for all the reasons you said of it. So vulnerable. We're all fragile, imperfect human beings and we're only ever in our own heads. So we kind of slip into this thought process that everyone you know, overly cares. Whereas the reality is that most people are so busy inside their own heads that they don't really realize or care about what's going on in your world. So they may read your book, but they're not necessarily, not necessarily going to, you know, judge you personally. Mm-hmm. But nevertheless, a really difficult thing to do. And it took me time. I was writing my first book in the shadows, returning to it as just this form of therapy tinkering away for seven or eight years. 
And I just reached to a point where I was like, this needs to stay in the draw forever, or I need to complete the process here. I'm part of completing the process with pitching it to agents or self-publishing or doing something. And I chose the latter and there was a lot of resistance there. In the early days when I started like blogging and writing and sharing things online, I would, you know, lean towards a bit of a pen name because I was mm-hmm. scared of putting me, Matthew, out there. Mm. But it, as with most things, gets easier the more you do it. You publish your first article, it's hard. By the time you get to 10, it's easier. A hundred, not so much of a big deal. A thousand, yes, it's not even a question in your mind. It's just like publish. And if people are going to think, they're going to think. If they're going to act, they're going to act. Whatever. It doesn't really matter. But it's a scary process. And there's still an element of vulnerability around it all. Less so, I suppose, with blog posts and social media posts. Mm-hmm. With something big like a book, where your blood, sweat, and tears quite literally find their way among the pages, <laughs> it's a terrifying run up. Mm-hmm. And I don't think that'll ever go away, but the more books you do, you-, you know, but there's a beautiful payoff as well. I have people approach me at events, conferences. And they walk up to me and they say, I, I read your book and I've been reading your articles and they think they know me because they do through the book, because I share quite a, a bit about my story growing up in Poland, coming to New York, having a, a career between you know two sides of the Atlantic. And it's, for me, it's a funny experience because I don't know them. They feel like they know me and they're my best friends already. And I say, let's... Let's pause for a second. I want to get to know you. Tell me more about you. Why do you think this book made such an impression on you? And it's a fun journey to see me catching up with them to the level of me knowing them as a partner in a conversation. So there's some payoff in that. Worth the risk. It is. It's a very intimate relationship you have with a book. Because when someone takes the time to write a book, a lot goes into that. Months, maybe years. So many drafts and re-edits and this, that, and the other. By the time you get to a point of reading a book, you're, you know, quite frankly stepping into that person's mind. And depending on how they write and what they share, it can be real raw, very real. So it's an intimate relationship and it's it's strange. I've had those instances like you've just described and sort of jarring when it's but lovely. Yeah. It's worth the risk. So let's talk about your book, Beyond the Pale a fable about escaping the hustle and finding yourself. So I read it on flights and at the airports on my recent business trip, and I couldn't put it down, and I was really looking forward to talking to you about it. How did the book come about? Tell me about the title, and I want to know about the cover, which is a beautiful mountain lake, beautiful landscape on the cover. So tell me about all those things. So we'll start with the inception. Um, Mm -hmm. Several years ago now, I think we're going back five or six years, maybe even a little bit longer. I published a book called The Successfulness. Over the course of a few years, I interviewed 150 odd people about success and failure and adversity, basically how they built success on the back of some kind of mistake or failure or issue. And as you can imagine, I learned a great deal researching that book and writing that book. Everything from how people further along the road than me define success and how they generally approached it. Give to my two into things like mindset and personal development and oh, so many other things. And it just, mm-hmm. I suppose like an onion, I spent years just peeling it and just learning new things and discovering new things. By the time I published the book, I was in a sense of wanting to go exploring myself. Mm-hmm. I didn't really have time to do much of it at that point because I was so busy doing all the research and listening to other people's stories. So I wanted to go on a bit of an adventure and start to figure out Matthews. And it led me to create a couple of courses and writing various other articles and short stories and things about nature. But I always liked this idea of combining my two passions of nonfiction, which I'd very much developed while writing The Success and Mistake and Fiction. At this point, I'd really novels. And as I was going down that rabbit hole of personal growth, and learning more about who I am and all the gray in between, I started to question my personal role in hustle culture. I started mm-hmm. to be curious about my relationship with work and that whole work-life balance. I started to question my relationship with success and whether I was actually doing what I wanted to do. And then one day, just seemingly out of nowhere, I came up with this idea where we would follow the journey of third man, a very successful individual, like the poster child of success. And I wanted to make it such an extreme version of success so that 
we could relate to him in a weird way. If I'd have made him just like anyone else, we'd have been able to relate. As a reader, you'd be able to relate and go, yeah, I can understand that person. But I think we put rich people, powerful people, famous people, et cetera, on a pedestal. Mm -hmm. We assume that once you reach a certain level of whether it's wealth or wisdom or power or whatever, suddenly you figure it out. That suddenly it all makes sense. And I just don't believe that's true. Mm -hmm. It's not to say that being a billionaire means you have greater problems than someone who's on the poverty line, because that would be ridiculous. A billionaire's problems is still more blessed than someone who struggles to make ends meet. But a billionaire is still going to have problems. A millionaire is still going to have problems. Those people at the top who have managed to take a step back and they have all these other works and managers leading their business, they still have problems, internal struggles, existential worries. They're still human. So I like the idea of making this extreme version where on the one hand, we can't possibly relate to because he has so much, so much. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, we admire and aspire to, at least on some subconscious level, because we believe if I get to that point, surely life will be easier. But then relate to him on a personal human level as the jury journey progresses and start to realize that it doesn't matter who we are, the walk of life we've been on, who we meet. We all share that commonality of human. That's kind of where the whole idea of Beyond the Pale spurred from. And the name, mm -hmm. it came, I suppose it was a, a term that I'd known for a number of years. I remember on one of my runs a few years ago now, a number of years ago, I was leaving, listening to Steel and Fire by Stephen Kotler and Jimmy Wheel. Mm -hmm. And it's this whole idea of, you know, going literally beyond your pale and finding that flow state. And at one point in the book, he mentions Beyond the Pale. And this was at a time when I was starting to explore third nine and think about what will this book look like? It just seemed very serendipitous. I was like, yes, that's the exact journey he's going to be going on. He's going to go beyond his pale. Mm -hmm. He's going to have to break down his business, break down his self in order to realize the journey he's been on and the journey he wants to be on. So yeah, that's kind of where the name came from. I love it. What about the cover? I really like the cover, maybe because I like the mountains and the, a lake in the mountains. It's just a beautiful thing to see, but tell me more about the cover. Where is this place? It's beautiful, isn't it? It's uh -huh. beautiful. I, oh man, someone told me actually, it's, it's one of the national parks in, I believe, North America. I can't remember which, but I can't lay claim to it. It was one of the very talented designers at my publisher, it's Morgan James. And they came up with a few different designs and they were all good. But that one just spoke to me. And we're not alone in loving that cover. I've had quite a number of people say, oh, that cover is just, yes, perfect. It stands out, I, which I, is great for a book cover, but it speaks to a soul, I think, as you say, like this idea of mountain. But it's very serendipitous. It's very meaningful as well because, and, and, I, and the designer didn't know this. I don't remember telling the designer this anyway. But the way that I've always built the analogy of Ferdinand's growth and this idea of growth in general is that of climbing a mountain. There's three phases. There's awareness, ascension, and then evolution on the other side. So awareness is this idea of like, once you've opened your eyes, you choose to stay awake or to, to roll over. And if you choose to stay awake, you must ascend the mountain. Mm -hmm. So as I was developing beyond the pale, even though mountains don't play a role in the story, they played a massive role in my development of the story. So it just spoke to me on so many ways. And I was like, yes, no, it's no questions beautiful. asked. This is the cover. It captures the essence of the book somehow to me. And uh, I kept looking back at the cover as I was reading the book. Quite a few guests on my podcast, one way or the other, talk about the idea that there's no economic threshold to anxiety, fear, and insecurity. And I think that's what you are touching on. And that's what comes across in the book. So Ferdinand is a very successful tech entrepreneur, with a company that's growing, getting bigger and bigger. He has billions already, or it's about to have billions. He pretty much accomplished a, a level of success that a lot of people imagine is the goal. And there's a moment where he realizes maybe this is not everything. And I'd love for you to introduce us to some of the people he gets to meet on his journey, and maybe share a few lessons that he receives from all kinds of wise people that enter his life at that moment when he's ready to search for something else or something different. Yeah, I wanted to make 
his interactions with people as a huge part of his story because it was a huge part of my personal story as I was going down this rabbit hole of self-discovery, interviewing all those other individuals. So I wanted to literally bring people who have inspired me Mm -hmm. into the story. So even though Ferdinand's a fictional character and his business is a fictional one, it's very much set in the real world. So he meets people who exist, like Jordan Harbinger and AJ Leon and Tim Harrington, Hollis Carter, Sol Alwell, to name just a few. Mm -hmm. I think there's 10 in total. And each person he interacts with, they share conversations, Mm -hmm. or in some cases, multiple conversations. And each one, I suppose, peels a layer of his onion, Mm -hmm. where he starts to go, "Mm, okay, I haven't thought about this, at least not in this way before. Maybe I need to see where that takes me. And these would be kind of conversations which are having with these people that inspired me in those ways over the years. So I asked, would I be able to, you know, interview you for the book, they'll be able to speak to you and just imagine what it would be like having a conversation with you in the shoes of, it was wonderful. So for instance, with Jordan Harbinger, he acts as the catalyst of Vietnam's entire journey where he starts to have him question his privilege, starts to ask, question, have him question his meaning, his purpose, mm-hmm. why he wanted to become a billionaire, why he wanted this massive business. And Jordan wasn't asking in a particularly arrogant way or playing devil's advocate, just curious. Like, why do you want that? And Ferdinand hadn't been around people asking him that. And once he had that question, he had to start to think, why do I want this? So each conversation leads them to a next conversation, whether it's through a connection and an invitation or whether it's just through a serendipitous situation. So a number of topics are covered, all which were very much top of mind at that point in my journey. So mm-hmm. things like our relationship with trust, trust with other people, but also our own personal trust, self-love, that feeling of, do you feel worthy? Do you feel enough? Do you feel adequate? I think mm-hmm. that's something we all struggle with on some level. I know it's something that I continue to battle with. The idea of success, the very definition of what it means, what it is, like what its actual role in life is. The relationship with mind, body, and spirit when he meets Jules Schreier in Bali, I believe it is. Mm-hmm. And just gravitating towards like those hell yeses. So you give yourself permission to actually say no. So they all lead into one another. And I, yeah, the book wouldn't be the same if it wasn't for those incredible people who shared wonderful insights. And I certainly hope that they have spoken to the readers in a way that they spoke to me because, yeah. They- Matthew, one big theme at the beginning, at least of the book, or the first one third, is the praise of achievement. That's what I wrote down for myself, how there's this conversation with someone, you might remind me who it was, about um, Ferdinand's parents. I think it's a lady that he meets that asks him, were they there praising you for all your achievements? And I recently was part of a conversation with quite a few parents. Those parents have kids that are graduating from good schools, And there was a lot of conversation what it took for them to get to those schools, what it took them to get through those schools. And now the achievement is that first internship out of that school that has to be a particular internship because it matters so much. And I immediately was thinking of your book and those words. There's this culture of a huge praise of achievement to the point that we forget why are we achieving it? And that part of the book had me thinking, can you talk about that? The praise of achievement and then we kind of get lost what are we trying to achieve? And we are praised for it by, you know, the parents, the people around us, then the board of the business that he's running, more and more and more. Can you talk about the, the, the attempt to escape that mindset? Yes, yeah, tough one. Um, mm-hmm. It was his conversation with Ishti Gupta, who was very raw and real with me when she was talking about her relationship with her parents. And how it was a loving one and a supportive one, but one that felt somewhat defined by achievement. So. You were more worthy if you had good grades. Mm-hmm. You were more worthy of attention if you were getting those good grades or doing extracurricular this, that, and the other. And I think to some extent, we all experience that. Mm-hmm. If not from our parents, then society's version of success, which is very vanilla and generic. If not through the media and society, then through the schooling system, mm-hmm. which is very much built around 
you've got to tick those boxes. You've got to work hard. And if in doubt, you should work harder. It's all very achievement based. It's not based around effort. Mm -hmm. It's not based around critical thinking or curiosity. Silly not based around creativity. Mm -hmm. It's based around do these things, do them well, and you will get rewards. As you say, you'll get to go to the good school. But then on the other hand of that, you just go through the same thing so you can get the good internship. And then you go through that just to go through the same thing so you can get a good job. And you right. go through it again so you can get the hmm. good promotion and on and on and on. And it's not to say that any of those things are bad. It isn't even to say that you don't want any of those things. But the real question there is, do you want those things? Mm -hmm. Is that important to you? And it's tricky with kids. I'm a father and I find myself constantly being cautious of this because my son and my daughter, my son's 10, my daughter's five. They're not of an age yet where they can comprehend the future. So you've got to do your best to try and guide them. I don't want to use the word success here, but just them up for their version of success when they get to a point of going out on their own. So you're trying to lay foundations. So I think for many parents, it comes from a good place. Mm -hmm. It comes from a place of, I don't know what you're going to do in your life in the future, but I just want you to get some good values now. I want you to get some good grades, good face, that and the other. So you've got the foundation so you can do something with yourself because you can't redo it. If you get to that point in life at 18, 20, whenever it is, and you haven't set those foundations, you're going to have to start from nothing. Mm -hmm. well, it will feel like nothing. It's harder than toxic because you develop this notion that I am only worthwhile if I am of worth mm -hmm. to school, to those actually curricular clubs to all these other things. I have to prove myself. I have to prove that I'm enough, that I am good enough. And that sucks. And we just mentioned it. It's something that I continue to you know, struggle with and I'm pushing on 40 now. So it's sad to think that we have that embedded into us from a young age, that we feel the need to prove ourselves to teachers, to parents, to other siblings. And then as we get older, to coaches, mentors, bosses. Mm -hmm. Constantly trying to prove that we are worthy enough and good enough. It's toxic. It's difficult. Some of those achievements are just a means to an end. And I think it's curious to pause and think about what's the end of it. So the degree, the school, the accomplishment, even the money. What does it serve at the end of the day? I think it's worth pausing. I always enjoyed reading books. And when I was a kid, at the beginning, when the school started, I still had a lot of time and I would just read what I was passionate about. And I had random selection of books. I was reading about snakes. I was just fascinated with snakes. And I was fascinated with Egypt. The two have nothing to do with each other, really. But as a kid, you go wherever your mind wants to go. And then yeah. once school started, you know, there were exams and obligations and I had less time to read random things. And it took me years after I left schools and I went to grad school, I left all of my schools that I really found more time to read random books just because I'm curious. And I think it's quite a privilege and a gift and the ability to have the time to sit down and read a book that has nothing to do with what you do as a career. You're just curious. And I, I love that I have the time to do it. And I, I hope more people do that too, because pursuing those interests opens up your mind to all kinds of different paths that are possible. Matthew, it's beautiful. Go, and go mm. It should be celebrated. I think it should def definitely be celebrated in children, but celebrated later in life too. Like you say, it's important to ensure there is a destination. Mm -hmm. as, we, as we bring up our kids, we're not going to know what that destination is and they're not going to know. But if we right. can bring them up in a way that they're constantly conscious of, so many things in life are just a means to an end and constantly be defining what that end is. Mm -hmm. they're going to go on a good journey. It'll be fun. It'll be interesting. And we shouldn't be trying to fit them in a box where they have to learn this, that, and the other just because, like you say, follow your interests, follow what's curious. It's, it should be celebrated. It's not, but it should. Yeah, it can be a fun journey. And Matthew, the other big theme in your book is about the idea that we're not really self-made. There's quite a conversation in the book about it. And I had the realization at some point in my life because I noticed how, you know, the professors that I came across, even the books that I read and uh, people I met, they all made some sort of an, left some sort of an impact on me and directed me in a certain way or inspired me in a certain way. 
I even would give credit to teachers that were not pleasant to me because I think I learned something from them too. Uh, maybe my skin grew thicker through the experience. But you can't take credit for everything, starting from your parents to your teachers and everybody on your path, your first boss, or even somebody that was sitting next to you during your internship that said a few things that pointed in you in a certain direction. Can you talk about the idea that we want to claim that we're self-made, but when you actually think about it, none of us are? No, it doesn't exist. Um, and it's not to say that you shouldn't take pride in what you've achieved. At the end mm -hmm. of the day, the life you built, whatever it looks like, you're the, person, you're the person directing it and you're living the life based on what you have and have not done. But the thought that anyone has done it on their own, it's ridiculous. As you say, there's so many people that play a role for starters, parents, teachers, friends, siblings, the authors of the books that you read, ridiculous. Like, there's just so many people that play a role in your life, but there is also the systemic level as well. And there's a great deal of systemic prejudice that exists mm. in the world, whether you like to admit it and be aware of it or not. There's many people who are becoming more aware of it in more recent times. But there's also a lot of people who like to continue to believe that it's not the case. But it is. There are narratives that have been interwoven into society's tapestry for hundreds of years. Some of them purposeful, some of them just naturally organic that grew over time. But the reality is that there are people born every day who are placed at different levels mm -hmm. simply due to chance. You don't get to choose your parents. You don't get to choose where you were born. You don't get to choose what your parents did and such and such and such. So depending on where you were born in the world, depending on the color of your skin, depending on the biological things going on inside you and how you represent yourself in terms of gender and sexual orientation or all those things, the difference between men and women, mm -hmm. there are certain things completely out of your control that are going to dictate and direct your life mm -hmm. over long periods of time. And some of those are beneficial and some of those are not. So it's important to get to a point in life in, as an adult and just being able to step back and going, although this is my life, I can't lay claim to it. Not mm -hmm. completely. I need to be appreciative, the good and the bad other people have played a role. I need to be appreciative of the good and the bad of the way that society is and the society that I am a part of. And in many cases, you didn't get to choose that. I didn't get to choose to be brought up in England. Mm -hmm. That was out of my control. I didn't choose my parents. I didn't choose the school that I went to and therefore all the good and bad traits that were passed on through that. I didn't get to choose the color of my skin. Mm -hmm. I didn't get to choose my sexual orientation, my gender of being male. All of these things just were. They were just placed upon me. And I have done what I tapped the point of the conversation that he had. On the one hand, Ferdinand did make a lot of things happen. He was right. driven. He was ambitious. He had a vision. He should have been proud of many, many of the things that he achieved and the accomplishments that he accomplished because he was the one who did them. But to think for his parents and the job that they had, they gave him tutoring mm -hmm. and that they were able to afford to send him to the college that they did, which gave him access to the people who are his early investors. They are the things which are so easy to lose sight of when you are caught up in your life and you take right. it for granted and go, but I had to work hard for it. And he's like, yes, you did. But mm -hmm. and we need to remember that but. And we need to capitalize the letters in that but. Because if we don't, we lose all sense of humility. We lose that's all true. sense of the grander picture. And that's when greed sets in. That's when people start to want more, more, more. But what about me? That's when victimhood mm -hmm. comes in. Why should I give to them? I've had to do all this myself. If we all have the ability to step back and go, I've had to work hard to be where I am today, but I genuinely think the world would be a much calmer, peaceful, and yeah, more prosperous place. Matthew, have you had people in your life at any point that told you, outright that you can't do something and despite of that you decided to do it i've i've always been quite lucky where i've not been surrounded by people who were vindictive like that mm -hmm. i've certainly had in a more subconscious like subtle way like mm, i don't know if you should try that it's putting yourself out there it's i've risky. certainly had that mm -hmm. yeah but i've always had supportive parents who you know were supportive of the decisions that i made i always had you know people around me thankfully which 
although they might not necessarily agree or like something mm-hmm. that I was doing, were going, okay, this is your life. You can, you can do it. Yeah, it's fascinating. Well, I'll tell you a quick story that I, I have a fading memory of not being able to speak English because I grew up in a country where you know, I spoke Polish. And I learned very early on, but one of my early teachers told me that I clearly have no gift for languages and I will never learn to speak English or any other foreign language. And I don't remember at what age I heard it, but it stuck with me. And in a way, I wanted to prove that person wrong. Yeah. (laughs) I think I would have learned English anyway, but I think it played a role in motivating me. So I think the way we react to even those negative influences in our life, it's kind of curious. I learned to speak French and I studied in French and now I'm learning Spanish. And so the teacher was absolutely wrong. And it's kind of embarrassing that a teacher that's there to teach you a language is telling you that you can't learn it. Well, is it a reflection on you or is it a reflection on them? I can't begin to unpack it, but it had a positive influence on me at the end of the day. And I'm sure some people might have stories like that. So whoever tells you that you can't do it, maybe it's a reason to keep going. Yeah. We have to take all those lessons, right? We're good on them. Right, as long as they, they keep you moving in the right direction. There is a beautiful quote that I wrote down and it got me thinking, and I'll read it to you. And the quote is, have you ever questioned everything you were sure you knew was true? And I really like it because, again, it makes me pause and think. I give talks now and then and I write books and there's a theme for me where I want people to show me where I'm wrong. I feel like part of my learning is maybe not exactly that I'm wrong, but maybe there's another way of looking at things. And from their perspectives, things look differently. And I always appreciate it because I feel like I'm learning through it. I really like that quote. Can you share more about that quote, how it came about, the questioning of everything that you thought you knew? Yeah, I believe it was when I was listening to, I forget which one of Mark Manson's book, I can't remember his first or his second, but on one of my many runs when I do a lot of my listening. And he talked about this idea of all we do in our lives is constantly debunk ourselves Mm -hmm. and we we constantly do it like one minute you believe something to be true until you learn something new prove yourself wrong it's a constant evolution that we go through yeah at certain points at all points in time you're certain about certain things like so certain i feel like this and i always will this is true to me this is my truth this will guide me. This will... Yeah, all we've ever done throughout our life is just move from one truth, proving it wrong, to create new truth, and so on and so on and so on. In various aspects of life. Sometimes we're learning very like logistical, rational things from books, like facts, like, oh, I didn't know that, now I do. Sometimes it's more emotional, existential. Like, okay, I'd never thought about it like that. Now I'm thinking about it like that. I can't not think about it like that. So I need to explore further. So that quote came from a place of those jarring aha moments where sometimes you just come across the right person or the right quote, the right book, the right story, whatever it may be. At that particular time, you may have heard it previously or a different version of it, but at that point in time, it stopped when you tracks mm-hmm. and you start to go, hmm, is everything that I've been pushing towards what I want? Is it true? Is it real? And I think we all go through those stages of life where we learn something new and it just seems to debunk everything up to that point. One of the big ones to me in more recent years, in the last sort of seven or eight years, is this idea of mindset mm-hmm. where, wow, I guess I knew that there was nuance within a mind, that everyone's different and that it's very complex, but I didn't really know it. And then when I learned about mindset, like growth mindset, fixed mindset, you know, the psychological aspects that go into all the inner work. And I am no expert by any means. There's an entire science into it. But I just dipped my toe into it enough to go, wow, this changes everything. Everything I thought to be true, the way I think, the way I react, the way I do absolutely everything. Mm -hmm. It's different now. I think we all go through those moments. So yeah, that's where that. Well, the last part you mentioned, the growth mindset, I think the revelation is that you can change, you can learn, and uh, the education doesn't end with the last degree you get, but you have a lifetime to continue to grow. And it's okay to change your mind. I even wrote an article that I titled, I changed my mind. And I wrote all kinds of ideas that have to do with investing that I changed my mind about. 
because I continue to, to grow and question. But the funny thing is that everybody around you will poke at the fact that you changed your mind because they yeah. say, oh, you used to do this. <laughs> yeah. And it's okay. And it's, it's okay. It's giving yourself permission to be like, I can change my mind. Mm -hmm. I can look at past me and go, he was wrong. But it wasn't like he was wrong. He was just misinformed. He knew what he knew. He had access to certain information, certain beliefs, certain experiences. So he built a belief, a version of truth around that. Mm -hmm. Now I have access to more, to different. So my perception, my sort of interaction with that thing is now different and that is okay. That is okay. There's a moment when uh, Ferdinand goes on a walk. He's alone with his thoughts. And you say in the book that's something he hasn't done in a while. And it was a very powerful moment because when uh, COVID happened, my wife and I would go on walks just to leave our New York apartment. And then we, as I mentioned to you, we left New York and stayed in a cabin in the woods. We could go on walks. It was a stressful time in the investment profession, but I think for everybody, it was a very stressful time for various reasons. And we would go on walks, just take a break. And on my podcast, I had guests that talk about the benefits of rest, of rest and benefit of slowing down. And I really like this moment in the book when he goes on a walk and for the first time in a while, he can actually hear his own thoughts. Can yeah. you talk about that moment? I feel like we all need moments like this in our routine, in our life. Yeah. We live in a very chaotic world. It's difficult. I talk about this a lot now with um, a lot of the sort of things which I write about and work on with, you know, hustle. Hustle culture is deeply ingrained into society now. It's very busy, very stimulating. Mm -hmm. There are just so much, so much noise all around us. We've become somewhat addicted to it. Even when we do get those moments of silence where we can take a break, we don't know what the hell to do with it. So we yeah. turn to the phone or switch the TV on because we're so out of practice to just mm -hmm. be with our own thoughts. I think this is why a lot of people, when you go dip your toe into like the personal development world, will want to at some point talk about like meditation or journaling, something like that. I don't think it's the point, like meditation isn't the point. It's not the point of being like at one with yourself or finding peace or it's just growing to be comfortable with a little bit of silence, to just reconnecting with those thoughts, those feelings, that inner voice, and just being okay with it. Not necessarily to do anything with it, to just allow it to be and to not have to feel the necessity to distract yourself with noise. Mm -hmm. But we're addicted to that noise. We're out of practice with silence, it's quite fear, like it's fearful. And it takes a bit of time for you to get used to it. And I'll, I'll anyone listening, watching this mm -hmm. right now, uh, I dare you to just sit in a room at some point today, switch everything off, allow all the things to be around you and just set the timer going and just sit there and do nothing for five minutes and feel how uncomfortable it is. Then if you get the opportunity to over the next couple of weeks, try and just go for a longish walk in nature, ideally. Mm -hmm. Don't take your phone. Don't do anything else. Just go for a walk. Have it be at least 30, 40 minutes. First, you will find your mind just going a mile a minute like everything else. So I can't distract myself with a phone, so I'll distract myself with my to-do list, right? Mm -hmm. I'm doing it. And it's hard and it's really nice. You can't switch off. But as the walk progresses, you get some air, you and you just start to let go slowly but surely. You'll find yourself just letting go of all those thoughts. You'll find yourself just being okay with the thoughts that are coming in, having to distract yourself right now, not have to be doing a thing right now. It takes a bit of time for us to get to that place because we're so out of practice. And I think that's what Ferdinand began to experience. He was so busy for so many years, going from one meeting to the next, building things, doing things, feeling the need to be switched on. He had a responsibility to it, mm -hmm. but he also had the addiction to it. And sure, he would distract himself every now and again to do a bit of journaling or meditation or yoga, but constantly finding it hard. Whereas when he just went for a walk for no purpose than to just walk, as 10 minutes became 20, became 30, became 40, it just became easier. And then further on in his journey, when he was doing more of that, more just existing, those inner voices started to have some real deep and meaningful conversations with him. Those thoughts, those feelings start to have a sense of validation, he started to unpack things bit by bit by bit. 
but it takes some time. It takes some practice. It takes some perseverance. It's shocking and horrifying that we have such a toxic relationship with silence, Mm. but it's just the nature of the world. And the only thing we can do is take control of what we can take control over and try and just reclaim a little bit of time as often as possible and just grow more in tune with silence. It may never be easy. You may never be a meditative monk who can sit there and find inner peace hour at a time, but if you can become someone who can enjoy a 30 minute walk without your world seeming to burn down, you're probably doing better than most. I I love the sound of that. And I gave a talk recently in Switzerland. And one of the points I was making was the benefit of moments of stillness, moments of a walk somewhere and a need for meditation. And some people are very uncomfortable with the concept. I had an investor friend on the podcast who shared that he was part of a silent retreat and then learned to meditate. I think people are not comfortable talking about it, but more and more people practice, practice it one way or the other. My wife and I picked up surfing during COVID and we go out and we surf. And there are those moments when there are no waves. And if you sit still long enough, nature around you claims you as a part of their world. And there are turtles that come up to the surface and catch some air. And I know people that have not seen a single turtle in the bay. And we see turtles every time we are out there. So they resonate with the calmness that you enjoy in the moment. And they see that you're no danger to them. They come up and catch a breath. And it's a wonderful thing to see. One of the most joyful things I've experienced recently, and they're few and far between because I, like everyone else, am part of this crazy life. It's busy. You know, I'm a dad with young kids. It's busy. Some of the most joyful moments I've experienced in recent years are when you're just doing something, you know, you're out in nature, you're going for a walk, you've, you've, you've tapped into that point. You just catch yourself going, Oh, this is peaceful. Mm-hmm. I've just allowed myself to be earlier. I had worries and I had thoughts. And I've just caught myself right now just existing. And it feels amazing. And if you can just give yourself that gift, even on a semi-regular basis, you'll set yourself free. I love it. Matthew, I have to ask you about freedom. There is a moment in the book when I hear the words, when I left, I was terrified, but at the same time, I felt truly free for the first time in a long time. It felt amazing. Because who is free in this day and age? Do you have any idea what that's worth? And you mentioned how there are many people with so much money, but they are miserable because they feel imprisoned. Tell me about that feeling of freedom. Well, yeah, right? What is it? It's like, what is success? What is freedom? It's a, and I think it's important for us to take a step back and question like, if I achieved freedom, what would that look like now? Because I imagine it changes throughout life. We mm-hmm. go to different chapters in life. So freedom in your 20s is going to look different to freedom in your 30s and so on. But just having to explore what freedom means to you, I think is very freeing in in and of itself. But absolutely, freedom is rare in this world for all the things that we've discussed earlier. It's busy, it's stimulating, it's relentless. We're distracted by so many things. So many things are vying for our attention. Freedom ultimately, I believe, hinges around just a sense of being that we talked about earlier, whether that's in nature, whether that's just a few moments, whether it's days, weeks, months at a time, it's just allowing yourself, having a life where you can simply be from Mm -hmm. time to time. I think that's freedom. I don't necessarily fully understand yet what freedom even means to me, but yeah, I think it surrounds this idea of being, just simply being. I have one last question and it's not an easy one. But I'm curious about your definition of success. You've done a lot of research and study and you've thought about it a lot. So I'm curious, have you come up with a definition that works for you? I did um, a a number of years ago now. And it was around this idea of I wanted success for me was I find money and finances a very overwhelming thing. Mm -hmm. I find myself just worrying about it, overthinking about it and trying to be so organized and on top of it. So. Success to me for a long time was getting to a point where I didn't think about money Mm -hmm. on a day like that. It's like, it was just taken care of. I think I'm still linked to that version of success because I'm yet to 
you know, truly live that life. But I also think I'm entering a different chapter of my life where I've already begun and in the not too distant future, I will need to continue to go down that path of exploring success and redefining success to me, trying to, I don't know, kind of gather my thoughts around what success means to me. Because I don't think it quite holds as true as it once did. Are you familiar with a concept of obliquity? I don't. So it's the idea of indirectly achieving other go our goals. So a lot of people want to be happy. And happiness is something that philosophers have a beautiful way of putting it. It's something you can't accomplish in a direct way. It kind of sneaks up on you. Maybe on that walk, maybe that time with your kids, maybe the time with your partner, maybe the time you're reading the book that you're really enjoying, it sneaks up on you. And when you look around, there are so many things in life that we accomplish in an indirect way. The reason I bring it up is because you have this quote in your book, there are more you want something, the less likely you are to find it. Do you remember that quote? Mm -hmm. It made me think of the indirect way of achieving certain things in life. Can you share a little bit more before I let you run? Yeah, I think there's something very powerful about letting go. Mm -hmm. We all, to an extent, I think, um, oh, we, just, we just want control. We want to cling on to control. We want to have control. We want to feel in control because control equals safety. Mm -hmm. But the reality is we have so little control of life and something very powerful happens when you just bit by bit begin to let go of those wants, those desires, those goals. To an extent, that vision of success, freedom, meaning, just letting go and letting what be, be. I find stoicism is fascinating for that, just this idea of letting go and letting what is to be. You have no idea what will happen when you do. That's the point. But as you say, things like happiness and fulfillment, satisfaction, they tend to be a byproduct of just letting go. So the more you try to do something, achieve something, be something, the lost you're more likely to feel because you're so busy searching. You get tunnel visioned. You're searching for something and it needle in a haystack and you haven't stopped to look around and realize you're in this beautiful forest. You don't need that needle because why the hell do you need a needle when you're in a beautiful forest like that? But you're so fixated on looking for that thing that you lose sight of everything. Matthew, I think this is a beautiful place to stop this wonderful conversation. And I learned a lot. You wrote a beautiful book, Beyond the Pale. I will include links to your books and your resources so people can learn more about your work. But thank you for sharing this hour with me. I, I really enjoyed it. And I felt that I had you with me as I was reading the book, but this felt even better to actually have you with me here and, and take you on a journey through the process of writing this book and the journey that your hero in the book was on. And I think in many ways, we all are on some sort of a journey and it pays. there's a payoff in pausing and thinking. Where are we going? Why are we going there? And maybe some things we already have, we're not appreciating them enough. And I highly recommend for people to wait for the turtles to come up and catch a breath. I think some special things can happen. I love that. Well, thank you so much for having me. That's such a wonderful exploration. Thank you, Matthew. Until next time. You were listening to Talking Billions. We talk about big ideas, big inspirations, big topics. We take on the hardest subject of all, money. But our conversations lead us to an even bigger question, what it means to live a rich life beyond money. If you enjoyed the show, please take a moment and follow, subscribe, rate, and share with friends and family. We rely on word of mouth to promote the show. One click for you means the world to us. Thank you. Until next time, your host, Bogomil Baranowski. The content of this podcast is for general informational purposes only, and so are the opinions of members of Seacard Associates, a registered investment advisor, and guests of the show. This podcast does not constitute a recommendation to buy or sell any specific security or financial instruments or provide investment advice or service. Past performance is not indicative of future results. More information on Seacard Associates is available in its Form ADV disclosure documents available 
at advisorinfo.sec.gov. Thank you.